I've got a question for you, um, something to think about, something that plagues people's minds, that troubles me sometimes, and maybe it's troubled you in the past. Um, the question is, if God doesn't change, why do we bother praying? If God doesn't change, why do we bother praying? If God has determined uh, what's going to happen in history, if God knows the beginning from the end, if God has decided where this world's going, if God's in charge of the past and the present and the future, then why are we bother praying to him? I don't know if um, I remember when I was a kid, and it might have been the same for you when you're a kid and you're loading up the car to go on holidays. Uh, it's going to be a long drive, but you know in advance that Dad just wants to get there. Dad doesn't like stopping. Once he's in the car and you're going, that's it. You just get there, unless Dad needs to stop. But he doesn't like stopping. So you know as a kid it's not worth asking, is it? It's not worth asking Dad to stop because he's already made his mind up. He doesn't change. Is that what it's like with God? Maybe you're a, uh, a, a shift worker and the roster comes out and you know the boss has said that uh, once, the, once the roster's out, that's it, but you've been put down to work on the day of Granny's 100th birthday and you're going, what am I going to do about it? Is it any use asking the boss because, as he said, once the roster is out, don't bother asking me to change it. So why bother? I'll just have to take a sickie instead. Well, maybe you've been praying for someone to be healed of cancer. There's no signs of improvement. They're going downhill. And it seems obvious that God isn't going to heal them. Uh, people around you are saying, well, it's just fate. It was just meant to be. And you think, well, if it's his plan to heal them, then he's going to do it anyway, whether I pray or not. So why bother? If God, if God's already made his mind up, why do I bother praying? Now you might be wondering why we're asking this question. It seems a bit of a, a downer after we've had all this positive encouragement over the last month to pray, uh, to to be persistent and consistent in prayer, uh, to be because we know we're praying to a loving, covenant-keeping God uh, who who loves to hear us pray and uh, who who wants us to come to Him. We know He hears us. But this is a question that often lurks in the back of people's minds. If God's in charge of everything, then why bother? There's an interesting verse in 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 6. It says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. And Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. If God's like that, then is it any use praying? What does our prayer do? Why bother praying? If God has planned the whole of history and God doesn't change, why bother? It is true, isn't it, that God doesn't change? There's a fancy word for this. God is immutable. There you go. Go home and impress your relatives with that one. God is immutable. That means God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. God doesn't change, but it's interesting as you read through the Bible, it's interesting you find that God does respond to the prayers of his people. And it's something that often confounds us and amazes us as, as you read it. Have a look in that Revelation Bible reading uh, that we had a little bit before from Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. The background of this, if you look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, um, page 1854, I'm on. Um, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, uh, there's, uh, the writer sees all the people who have been uh, slain for their, their faith, who have been killed for being Christians. And in, in verse 10, in a loud voice, they call out, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And it's interesting that he says they were told to wait a little while longer. See, they call out to God for justice and judgment. Make it happen, God. But look over in chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, what happens. Uh, there's an angel in verse 3 who had a golden censer. He came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, 
went up before God from the angel's hands. The angel's hand. So the prayers of all these people who have been uh, killed for their faith, uh, all, the, all of God's people, are going up to God. And what happens? Verse 5, immediately the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And I love that passage because it says that our prayers do reach God, first of all. It tells us that our prayers get to God. But secondly, you see, God acts. God acts. He responds to the prayers of his people. His people call out for justice and for judgment. And God brings that justice and judgment to the earth. God responds to the prayers of his people. And you could say, yeah, well, God was going to do that anyway. He'd said back in chapter 6, just wait a little while longer. So obviously it was his plan to do it anyway. But it's great to know that God does respond to the prayers of his people. It's amazing, isn't it, to think that this sovereign God of all the universe who has, who has planned the whole course of human history hears our prayers and responds to them. Do you know why we have a McDonald's in Narrabri? No, my daughters didn't pray for McDonald's in Narrabri, no. But let me tell you a story. I think I can take a bit of credit for it, you see. Because because in 1990, when I was a youth worker in Wee War, um, there was a letter to the editor in the Sydney Morning Herald which said, it was a lady from Campbelltown in Sydney, out the west of Sydney, and uh, said, um, the government should do something for our kids because our kids don't have the same things the kids, the kids in the city have and they should be spending more money out here and, um, and, and doing stuff for our kids. And I, I, I wrote a letter from Weewar. I said, you look, I know it is a problem in the outer suburbs of Sydney, uh, but think about the kids in, in Weewar uh, who don't even have local transport to their nearest town. Uh, think about what they've got and, and what the government could do out there. And the last line of my letter was... Uh, besides, it's 215 kilometres to the nearest McDonald's, which is a five-hour round trip, because at the time, the nearest McDonald's was Tamworth. Now, a week later, I got a letter from McDonald's, and uh, it had five vouchers for free food, uh, which said, I hope this makes your next trip to McDonald's a little cheaper. And then 20 years later, we come back to Narrabri, and lo and behold, there's a McDonald's. So... I think I can take, isn't it amazing how when you, when you call out for help, they respond? Even someone as big as McDonald's. Isn't it amazing to think that the sovereign God of all the universe hears our prayers and he responds? We say, but in that case, God was always going to judge the earth. Does God ever change the course of his actions as a result of prayer? Well, it's interesting. The Bible uh, has some great examples of uh, what it calls God relenting, when God relents. And uh, in that Psalm 90 that we read before, don't turn to Psalm 90, turn to Exodus chapter 32. In Psalm 90, we, before, we saw uh, David praying that God would relent, that God would change. Uh, but have a look in Exodus chapter 32, page 132, the church Bibles. Exodus chapter 32. And what's happening here is that um, Moses has led the people of Israel. Uh, God has rescued them from Egypt. Moses led them into the desert and they've got to Mount Sinai. And uh, Moses has gone up onto the mountain to get the Ten Commandments uh, from God. And lo and behold, what's happening down the bottom? People are getting itchy feet and they're grumbling and complaining. They're going, where is this Moses? Uh, in verse 1, uh, verse Two or one, they say, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't even know what's happened to him. So Aaron said, Take off your gold earrings. Uh, they give him the gold. Verse 4 He took what they hand, handed to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Incredible. <laughs> This is your God who brought you out of Egypt, this golden calf. What a load of... Right. Anyway, look down in verse 7. How does God respond? Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. 
They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. See, God responds in justice and judgment. He's going to destroy the people. What happens? Verse 11. But Moses sought the favour of the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people? whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I'll give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Interesting passage, isn't it? Moses prays, God relents. Has Moses convinced God, this unchangeable, immutable God, to change his mind? Look at what Moses is doing there. He's saying to God, remember your promises. Remember the covenant uh, that you have established with the people. See, Moses isn't asking God to change, even to change his mind, but he's asking him to be true to his nature, to remember the covenant that he had made and to act on that covenant. We know in, in uh, if you looked over to Exodus 34, I think it's on the screen, uh, in Exodus 34, we know this God, the God of the covenant, uh, because he reveals himself to Moses in verse 34 with these words, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. You see, God is holy and righteous and just and God will bring judgment on those who fail to keep his covenant. But God always promises to show mercy and compassion and forgiveness to those who turn to him in humble repentance. We need to remember that about God. We need to learn this about God. God is entirely consistent and everything he's, he does in the Bible, he's consistent with his character. His nature and his character never change. He may change his course of action, but it's always going to be in a manner consistent with the nature of God that he's revealed to us. He acts consistently in every situation. Now, I'm not allowed to use my family in sermon illustrations. So I want you to imagine a fictional family, okay? Uh, there's a mother and let's say four daughters. And uh, the mum's going out shopping and she says, right, we're going to eat healthy. We've been eating too much rubbish. Uh, we're going to eat healthy and I'm just going to buy healthy food down at the shops. And the daughters say, mum, can you get us some chocolate? And she goes, sure, fruit and nut? Rum and raisin? What would you like, Kit Kat? See, she's not changing her, her, her character, is she? She's acting consistently with what we know of her. <laughs> Entirely consistent with her character. That's a fictional person. <laughs> you see, a number of times in the Bible, God changes his course of action. Uh, you see it with Jonah, don't you? What does God say to, to Jonah? Go and tell Nineveh, 40 more days and they're done. They're wiped off the face of the earth. Forty more days and I'll destroy them. And when Jonah finally gets around to telling them, what happens? They repent. And, and they, they have national days of mourning for their sinfulness. And God 
relents from sending disaster. He shows compassion and mercy and forgiveness. It's amazing, isn't it? But God is acting entirely consistent with his nature. And as we think about prayer and about is it, is it worth praying, why bother praying? We've got to remember that God is always going to act consistently with his nature. And we can ask God uh, the, uh, in the New Testament where it says, ask God for anything, ask God fully trusting. We should always ask in line with his character and his will. We should be confident to pray because we are confident in who God is and what we know about him. We know his holiness, we know his justice, we know his righteousness, but we also know his love and his compassion and his mercy. God is always going to act in line with his nature and he, he has relented in the past. He has changed his course of action, but he will never change who he is. And as I was thinking about this question, I was also thinking about why, why did Jesus pray? you ever thought about that? Why did Jesus pray? Because often we think about prayer as is asking God for something to happen, asking God to do something. But Jesus was is God. Uh, he had the power to make stuff happen just by speaking. He calmed the storm with a word. He cast out evil spirits with a word. He raised a small girl from the dead. He raised a young man from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead with a word. Jesus can make stuff happen. He is God. So why did he pray? Well, if Jesus prayed, then it must mean that praying is something different than just asking God to give me what I want or asking God to make something happen. Praying is much more than that. Praying says, God, I'm going to trust you in this situation. I'm going to trust you to act according to your character, according to your nature in this situation. It's an expression of complete trust and dependence on God. You're in charge. You will do what is right. I need to trust you. And prayer is building a relationship with God. And sometimes you do that uh, you might even do that by expressing your anger and your frustration to God because that's what David did, wasn't it, in the Psalms? Let's have a, let's have a look at a few quotes uh, from uh, the Psalms. He says to God, uh, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Can you hear his frustration there? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. If David is able to go to God with, with his frustration and with his anger because he knows who God is and he knows that he can rely completely on God and depend on God. If you're a Muslim, you would never pray these prayers. Because for a Muslim, that is blasphemy to say things like that. But Christians are invited to pray to God like this. To approach God with our frustrations, with our anger, with our sadness. Because we can trust him. And we know that God hears our prayers and he responds to our prayers. And he wants us to come to him. Even see, Have you thought about that? God wants us to come to him even though he knows what we're going to say before we even say it. Look at Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. God knows what you're thinking and he knows what you're about to say. He knows what you're praying. Isn't it a great relief to pray to a God who knows what we're going to ask before we even ask it? Does it make you more confident? It makes me more confident. Even if, I, even if I stuff up my prayers, God knows what I meant to say. Even if I can't say what I'm, I'm trying to say, 
God knows it. And it stops me from thinking that the effectiveness of my prayer is on how well I pray or how long I pray for or how often I pray or how, how many big words I use in my prayers. And in fact, Jesus spoke against that, didn't he? In Matthew 6 when he said, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Isn't that a great relief? That you, can, you can just have a big mind blank in the middle of your prayer time, but God knows. God knows what's on your mind. He knows what you're asking, even though you can't get it out. What happens if I don't pray? God's will is done whether you, uh, whether you pray or not. Um, but what happens when we don't pray is that we miss out. We miss out. We miss out on growing in dependence on God in prayer, on seeking his will. You see, prayer is not a duty. Prayer is a privilege because it's, it's, it's like when we see Jesus praying, he is showing his reliance and his trust and his dependence on his Father. He's drawing strength from his time alone with his Father. See, prayer is a privilege. It's not just about looking for answers, but it's about seeking God himself. It's not just about looking for answers, it's about seeking God. Have a look in uh, Jeremiah 29. I alone know the plans I have for you. It's God speaking to Israel. Uh, they've been into exile and they're wondering about, the, do they have any future? He says, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me, you will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. See, prayer is not about finding answers. It's about finding the God who knows the answers. It's about seeking God. So prayer is good for us because all our thoughts and desires and concerns are in the mind of a loving and compassionate Father who just happens to be the sovereign ruler of the universe. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Um, I was trying to find this story and, um, John helped me a bit this morning. JFK, the president uh, of the United States, uh, when he was president, um, and I can't remember the exact details of the story, but I remember one of his his uh, helpers or his aides or whatever um, commented that when the president's son walked into the Oval Office in the White House, the president stopped everything that he was doing and he paid attention to his son. And at that point, his son was the only one that mattered. Isn't it amazing, the most powerful man in the world? But he's, when his son comes to him, nothing else matters. You ever thought that's what it's like with you and God? The God of the universe. The God who has determined the past, the present and the future. Wants to listen to your prayer. Wants you to come to him in prayer. He's planned all of history. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how many days you will live for. There's not one sparrow that falls to the ground that God doesn't know about. He knows the whole of history, past, present and future. And he invites us to pray. What a privilege that is. It's not a duty. It's a privilege. In uh, Jeremiah 33, God says, Call to me and I will answer you. I will tell you wonderful, marvellous things that you know nothing about. And in Philippians 4, 6, we're encouraged, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we can pray knowing that God wants us to pray to him wants us to come to him, that he will respond to our prayer. We can pray confident that God will never change, that he will always act consistently with his nature. And he wants us to be content that although we don't know all the answers, we know the God who knows all the answers. 
And prayer will help us to grow in our trust and dependence in the sovereign God, the King of kings and the Lord of all history. Let me pray for us. Father God, we, it's hard for us to imagine uh, that you, the sovereign Lord of the universe, want us to speak to you, each of us, individually, together. You want to hear us. You want to know what we're feeling. Lord, we just can't imagine that. But we thank you for it. We thank you, God, that you do listen to the prayers of your people, that you do respond to the prayers of your people. But Lord, we also thank you that you will never change, that you will always do what is consistent with who you are, a loving, merciful and compassionate God, a God of justice and a God of mercy. Father, we pray that you'd help us to trust you more and more so that we will come to your presence more and more, be more persistent and consistent in our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.